Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Great to be here. Um, as, as, as advisors and insurers, you all know that sitting is the new smoking. You've just sat through a lot of spe uh, speeches, so I'd love you to stand up for a minute. Yeah, have a bit of a stretch. And what I want you to do is just go up and down on the balls of your feet. I want you to do about 10 times. What this does is it gets the blood pumping from our legs up to the penthouse of our brain. And as you do this, just casually look at your neighbour and see how awesome they look. <laughs> All right, keep it going. Now what I want you to do is start rubbing your hands together. Let's get some energy going, some friction. All right. And then I'm going to count from three down to one, and we're going to do one single clap, okay? Three, two, one. Awesome. Please sit. So this morning, just so you know, I've, been, I've got the last cab off the rank, and I'm going to give you a very relaxed, chilled, calming talk on stress. And one of the things that occurred to me is the fact that apparently public speaking is up there with open heart surgery as far as stress goes. Stress goes. So I'm, I'm clearly in the wrong business. And that whole idea of, I don't know if you've heard it, but people say, just imagine that everyone's naked. Doesn't do it for me. In fact, it's quite terrifying. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so I'm here, and, and listen, I want to give you a small couple of little caveats. Not all stress is bad. Stress is there for a reason, and hopefully what I'm going to talk to you this morning about is how we can make stress our friend, you know, how we can work with it rather than sort of trying to fight against it all, all the time. You're going to see a lot of images, you're going to hear a lot of ideas, a lot of metaphors, and I just want you to keep your hearts, your minds, your eyes, your souls out for the one or two that genuinely resonate with you. So one of the things that is very fortunate about me and what I do, and I get to travel this fair country, I get to see pretty much every facet of the community. I've spoken to the Reserve Bank, I've done a national tour of the NRL, um, I've spoken to coal miners, I've spoken to the Prison Wardens Association of New South Wales, I speak to schools, you know, you name it, I've pretty much spoken to them. And what I really love about it is I get to get dropped into these sorts of environments, and I get to figure out, you know, I'll find out a little bit about each culture. This is the second AFA tour that I've been on. And the things that I've found out about you guys are things like, you know, you're in this a lot of it, a lot of you, because it's people facing. You enjoy working with clients, you enjoy helping them out. You're of genuine service to me. I'm a creative person, like I've done all these drawings. I don't have a financial bone in my body, so I'm really grateful to the service that you offer me. You help people realize their goals. There's a certain flexibility in how you work. Uh, you make a nice bit of coin. And I believe there is real genuine meaning and purpose to what you guys do. On the downside, however, it's also a people-facing industry. Um, I've spoken to quite a few of you and you say, yeah, quite often I'm the punching bag or I'm the, prosy, the, 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 the proxy psychologist to my clients. You know, when things go wrong, I seem to cop it. Are uh, you trying to solve their problems? Um, there is an uncertain and volatile environment. There's a bit of reform fatigue, which we've heard about this morning. Uh, higher education standards, uh, keeping up with the old thing of technology and like all of us, trying to maintain a good client base. Now, I'm not a financial planner, but I did spend 15 years working in advertising, which I have to say made me go quite blonde. This is not out of a bottle, it's perfectly natural. I call it my extinguished look. And look, you know, it was an interesting job, and it, you know, I wouldn't change it because it taught me what I do now, which is communicating simply and effectively. But I've got to say, it did make me go a little bit mad. The one thing that I did love about it was it was, like you guys, solving problems, you know, cracking ideas, being creative in my thinking, but with it came pressure. You know, I was only as good as my last ad, I was only as good as my last campaign, I was only as good as the last bit of business that I bought in, I was only as good as the last award that I won, whatever it was. I had some awesome clients, but I had some really, really difficult ones as well, which made life quite tricky. There was the never-ending deadlines, the KPIs, I always say, like, for me, it was like scrambling to the top of a sand dune, only to plant a little celebratory flag to roll down the back to start another sand dune, or another five or another ten sand dunes at the same time. And through it all, I discovered that I was a bit of a perfectionist. And look, like a bit of stress, a bit of perfectionism isn't bad, because it actually makes us do a good job. It makes us take pride in what we do. It's there for a reason. But when it starts to become a little bit obsessive, it can certainly get in the way of a good outcome. For me personally, when I was working in the ad industry, I began to be really disappointed with outcomes. I didn't really trust anyone. And you know, it was, it's just an impossible bar to try and jump over. So I found I couldn't relax. 
No matter how tired or exhausted I was, I couldn't sit still. I couldn't sleep. And when good sleep goes, everything that depends on that sleep goes out the door with it. It's your mood, it's your memory, it's your ability to get stuff done, it's your concentration. I never felt there was enough months in the year, weeks in the month, hours in the day. I wanted to grow another pair of arms. I just constantly felt that I was always behind the eight ball. I was always kind of rushing to catch up. And I believe that when your head becomes full of stress, worry, uh, perfectionism, if you like, uh, concern, um, there's not a lot of room for creative thinking, problem solving, or clarity. And I didn't tolerate fools. Well, that was my excuse. And I just think, you know, we all know what it's like to be around unpleasant people. You know, it doesn't reflect well on you, so that doesn't help. And because I wasn't feeling particularly good myself, you know, being at an industry function like this would scare the hell out of me because I was always worried that I was going to be found out for who I generally was. So I just tried to avoid it at all costs. And eventually, because I was getting so stressed in my job and because I was a male and because I wasn't really taking care of myself and I wasn't getting the help that I needed, I started to become not only overwhelmed by my job, but life in general. And then I became quite sad. And I've got to say that if you have got ongoing, uh, persistent stress going on in your life and you're not dealing with it, if you're not taking care of it, it is one of the biggest precursors to mental health issues, whether it's anxiety or depression or insomnia or whatever it is. And I'm here as an example of what to do and what not to do. So, um, but anyway, since then, I have dedicated my life to understanding what makes us tick, what makes us happy. And if you want to see my backstory, you can go online. Uh, if you Google, I had a black dog, I, wrote a, I created a book and then a little video for the World Health Organization, and you can see it then. But since then, I have dedicated my every you know, waking hour to understanding what makes us tick, you know, what makes us well, what keeps us happy, all those sorts of things. But I've got to say I'm work in progress. I'm not a superhero like none of us are. And case in point was um, in 2010, I wrote this little book called The Alphabet of the Human Heart. This was a little book about meaning, purpose, uh, balance, you know, all those sorts of things, living a good life. And it was A is for adventure, B is for balance, C is for compassion, D is for daring, E is for enthusiasm. But then if you turn the book over, it was another book. So it was A is for anger, B is for boredom, C is for criticism, D is for depression, E is for ego. I'd been thinking about this little book for about 14 years. It had been going on in the back of my mind. And I always thought, well, look, we never stop learning. We never actually stop growing as humans. So why not create an alphabet for us adults? Anyway, this is where my perfectionism and my stress levels came to an absolute head. And, uh, and what happened was I had hired a graphic designer to take a bit of the load from me, but I was doing all the concepting, I was doing all the drawing. Um, the graphic designer didn't work out because of my perfectionism, so I had to let it go. So I was doing all the graphic design as well. And, uh, and I was working with my childhood friend, James Kerr, who's also a writer who was the guy who got me into advertising in the first place. Amazing writer, but he was living in London. So we could only speak first thing in the morning or at the end of the day. And I hadn't seen anything from James for about six months, and I was getting really worried that we were getting towards the deadline to deliver to the publisher. Anyway, one night after a couple of vinos, I sat down, as we shouldn't do, at the email, and I wrote this email. Not coping, not enjoying the process, can't sleep, blah, 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 blah. And poor old James on the other side of the world must have got this, copped this bloody email from me and he's a very wise and humble guy, and he took a bit of time, he took a couple of days to actually respond to my email. Now, I want to say, you know how when we get to certain points in our lives and we have that kind of epiphany or a moment or we overhear a conversation or we see a headline in a newspaper or a bit of graffiti, and it's just like, ah, I get it. This is what I got from James's email, and I went through my, I don't know, 15,000 emails that I've got on my computer, and I found what he wrote, and this is what he wrote. Best bit of advice I've ever had. <laughs> Read the lovely book. And, you know, I kind of laughed, and then I kind of cried, and then I shut the computer, and I vowed to myself from that moment on that I was never going to get that bent out of shape ever again. Because the moral of the story is often not the situation, but simply your reaction to it. No one was telling me to hurry up. No one was telling me to get on. You know, I have a saying which I really love, which is not only are we the mugged, but we're also the mugger. So it was just me beating myself up. Um, I had another friend call me one time and said, how are you, Matt? And I said, I'm really bloody stressed, Judy. And she said, well, you know you are what you say you are. And I went, what? 
And she said, well, you are what you speak. And she said, try saying, I'm really calm and everything's good in my world. And she was absolutely right. We are what we say we are. I've heard Nick Hake say, you know, he doesn't like the word uh, stressed. He likes the word focused, which I think is really good. Anyway, last year I teamed up with a guy called Dr. Michael Player, who's a clinical psychologist. I met him at the Black Dog Institute, where I do a lot of consultancy work. Uh, he has done a lot of work with uh, fly on fly at manners, and he's got a particular interest in the study of stress. And we're doing a book uh, which is coming out next year. I actually haven't started putting it together yet, but I'm going to remain really cool and calm about it. The nub of this is based from this research that shows that Harvard researchers have found that 75 to 90% of GP visits are caused by stress. So if you've got migraines, if you've got insomnia, if you've got irritable bowel, if you've got um, anxiety or depression or whatever it is, there's a fair chance that the base of this comes from stress. So if all of life's woes are a pie, stress is the pastry. So look, as I mentioned before, stress is there for a reason. You know, back in the day, it helped put dinner on the table. It helped, you know, fight off a, an invading tribe. It helped fight off a, you know, an attacking saber-toothed tiger. It is there for a reason. We don't have those kind of stresses now. Today, our stresses are things like commute, no Wi-Fi, can't get a chai latte. You know, these, oh, you know, obviously there's bigger stresses than that, but you know, these are the sort of things that we face. So we don't have this. What I want to say today is that stress is natural. It's normal, and most importantly, it should be temporary. And look, if I was to say to you, you know, at the moment, it's really interesting when you look at statistics. You know, we are currently at the longest period in history without a major world war. We have the highest standard of living. Um, our health care is really good. Our education standards are really good. In, you know, infancy death is way down. Uh, we are living longer. You know, there's a lot of really good stuff going on. But I suppose the thing for me that I've realised is that we're constantly exposed to so much uh, bad news. You know, we're there 24-7. We hear about the environment. We hear about terrorism. Um, you know, Donald Trump. I don't know. Anyway, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we get bombarded with. And, uh, and so that's part of the reason. When we look at the old faithfuls, you know, nothing much has changed. You know, there's still the relationships. There's still the finances. There's still the job, uh, the kids, all those sorts of things. So, how are we coping with the stress? Because apparently, we are, in this modern day, the most stressed we've ever been. So, how are we coping with it? Well, you might be interested to know that in the last year, we drank uh, 7.9 billion standard nips of alcohol. New Zealand has heard about this research, and they want to rise to the challenge. <laughs> That's an incredible amount of alcohol. And apparently, one in five of us drinks 75% of that amount. So, there's a few of us with a bit of a bigger problem than others. Uh, with gambling, you know, we've got the TAB, sports bet. But if you go onto your app store and look up slots or casinos or gambling, whatever it is, you will find hundreds and hundreds of apps now where we can lose our money. Um, if you go onto the ASIC uh, credit card clock, uh, we're currently running at around about $32 billion in credit card debt. We are the third or fourth uh, country in the OECD with that amount of debt, so we're pretty up there. Um, and also, we're getting lost in technology. You know, how often do you go to the airport or the train and what is everyone doing? They're doing this. And you know the person who benefits from this the most? It's the physio, because we're all getting stuffed necks and buggered shoulders. I actually heard a guy the other day who actually was given a photograph and it was wrapped up and he unwrapped it and he looked at it and he tapped on it and tried to enlarge it. That's what we've come to. <laughs> <laughs> kind of sad. And the research would also show that we are finding the most stress in our places of work. And this is unfortunately is where we go to bury ourselves in our work to avoid the stresses that are going on in our lives. So what's happening to us with all the stress? Well, you might think that stress affects us mentally, but it affects us on so many other levels. Physically, it can make us unwell. Emotionally, it can make us cranky and fly off the handle. Socially, it can make us withdrawn. Behaviorally, you know, we might be reaching for the carbs or the chocolate or the sugar or a little bit more alcohol than we should. I think it's also really important to understand um, how stress works on our nervous system. There's three types of nervous system. There's one called the enteric, which is basically to do with our gut and our digestion. But the one that I suppose affects us the most is the sympathetic. I don't think it's, you know, it's a bit of an irony that's called the sympathetic. But this is the fight or flight. This is where our muscles get pumped with glucose. This is where we get our bodies flooded with adrenaline. This is where our pupils enlarge and we can hear more and we're just ready to take it on. Uh, my wife recently, uh, we live in the Northern Beaches, and she went to a bra party. It's a thing, apparently. Tupperware is so five minutes ago. 
Anyway, when she was leaving the bra party, um, she, uh, she was walking down the steps and her friend Anna was walking in front of her. And there was a staircase that went down and then to the right. And there coiled up in the middle of the step or in the, in the corner was a brown snake. And what Ainsley meant to say was, um, Anna, um, look out, there's a brown snake. But what came out was, <laughs> she hates snakes, absolutely loathes them. And the next thing she knew, she was over a fence, which was about five and a half feet high. She has no memory of getting over it. And she landed in the garden next door, which is probably where the bloody snake came from in the first place. Where we want to be is the parasympathetic nervous system. And this is where our rest and digest digest. I was in Mexico, and this is where I go to my happy place. I went to a beach called Zipolite, and I was under a thatched roof in a hammock. Beautiful breeze, warm, listening to the surf. I was watching the you know, dappled light coming through the roof. I was snoozing, breathing, you know, drinking a cold Fanta every once in a while. I hate Fanta, but it was just good in that environment. That is where we want to be, is just where we just calm down, have a breath, and we relax. And unfortunately, we, we're avoiding this state more and more. So for me, I think, you know, it's all about owning your problems. It's about owning your stress, accepting what's going on. It's a little bit like going to Manly or Bondi and getting stuck in a rip. You know, it's about ownership of that rip. If you go, fire up, I'm in a rip. I don't want to be in this rip. I want to get out of the rip. There's a fair chance you're going to get exhausted and you're going to get sucked under. Whereas if you actually go, I'm actually in a rip. I'm going to just go with the rip. There's a fair chance that you'll get spat out down the other end of the beach and to live another day. So what can we do? Well, you heard Jo this morning, she's a psychologist, and if you went and saw her, or if you saw any other modern day clinical psychologist, they'd probably say, try and engage with mindfulness, or try and engage with meditation. Look, I've never been to an ashram, I don't know the chakras, I don't know the mandalas, I don't sit on the floor in a yogi position, I don't know the meaning to life, but what I do know is when I practice mindfulness and when I practice meditation, my life is so much better. It is so much calmer. I'm so much more engaged. And if you want to know what mindfulness is, there's no kind of you know, wise old man sitting on the top of the, of the mountain. It is really just about paying attention. It's about observing where you are, what you're doing, how you're feeling, what you're thinking, without judgment. So it's about stepping back for yourself and just seeing where you are and just going with that. We have over 70,000 thoughts over a 24-hour period. So it's just about stopping and just engaging where we are. So a good place to start with mindfulness is in your shower in the morning. It's a great way. Just shut your eyes, feel the, feel the water splashing off you, smell the, you know, the suds of your shampoo or your conditioner, and before you get out, just slowly wind that shower over the cold. Don't yank it over because you have a bloody heart attack, but just go slowly over the cold and just shut your eyes and just feel how your body reacts. You'll feel yourself come a bit more upright. You'll feel the hairs go up on the back of your neck. You'll feel your breathing rise up. And more importantly, you'll be awake and in the now of the day. Another way is you guys are financial planners. You are people facing people. So next time you see your client, practice a bit of a mindfulness in the conversation that you have. Look them in the eye. Really listen to what they're saying. Think about what their problems are and their issues without jumping in with a bit of an armchair general or a story topping or telling them what to do. Just really be there for them and listen to what they're saying. We all have two ears and one mouth, so therefore we should listen twice as much as we speak. You're going into lunch today, so so often we're just stuffing our faces to get on to the next meeting. So I, I please you know, recommend that you slow down today. Look at your meal. Consider where it's come from. Look at the colours, the textures. Go through the taste. Shut your eyes as you're eating it. Go slowly. Just try and do this every once in a while. You enjoy your meal so much better, and that's so much better for you. And when you leave today, try and just go a little bit more slowly. Slow your gait. Slow your breath. Engage with your neck. Use your eyeballs. Try and pretend that you've never been here before and see the world as if you've never seen it before. And also, there can be really fantastic mindfulness found in the mundane. Washing the dishes ironing a shirt, taking out the rubbish, you know, hanging out the washing, those sorts of things. It's a really good time just to reflect on you, your day, how you're feeling, where you're going, and just being with that. Now, I suppose mindfulness or meditation doesn't solve the world's problems, it doesn't solve your world's stresses, but what it does do, and what I didn't have in my previous career, was it just gives you that bit of space. It gives you a bit of a buffer between what's going on, where you can find that space for creativity and problem solving. It's a very, very good thing to do. Now, on your table, you'll find you've got uh, a bunch of colorful rubber bands. If I could find someone who can be the designated rubber, rubber band giver, 
And if you could just pass the rubber bands around. And just, you know, you can take one or two if you want. Just choose the colors. No arguments. All righty. Stressing you out? Oh, sorry. So what I want you to do, put it on your wrist. Because I want to start International Rubber Band Day. We've got Are You OK Day, Red Nose Day. But what I want you to do is put it on your wrist, and next time you feel that tension rising, that stress rising, that boiling point, I just want you to simply give a bit of a snap. It's not virtual reality, I know. But it's just a very simple way to do it. And if you don't like snapping yourself, you can just look at it. And every, every time you look at it, it can remind you to pause, observe, breathe, check your posture, because how often do we sit really uncomfortably, have a stretch, and then re-engage? Now, one of the things that Michael and I want to do is we want to try and encourage people to get this idea or their heads around this idea of self-efficacy. And this is really, again, about checking in where we are and what we're doing. So we've got this thing called the stressometer, which is like an inter internal barometer, if you like. We all have things that flick our switches, that press our buttons. And what I'd suggest you this afternoon or tonight is just to write down all the things that you know really fire you up, that really get you in a state, that really stress you out. And then in the second column, I just want you to write down what you know, because we're all, it's different strokes for different folks, write down what counterbalances that. What is the thing that eases you off? I live in the northern beaches, so for me, it is going down to Manly, it is swimming in the ocean, it is having a fire pit, it's hanging out with my family, my friends, uh, walking my dog, uh, drawing, a, drawing an illustration or taking a photograph. These are the things that really chill me out. So early on this year, I just want to tell you a very quick story. Um, early on this year, I did a big keynote for a big organisation. It wasn't clearly as big as this room, but it was pretty big. The global CEO was coming, and, uh, and it was the first time I'd done a particular talk. So I was freaking out a little bit, but I was prepared. I'd done my work. I got there early. I parked in a car park in the middle of the city. Um, I had to meditate before my talk. Got down there. I had about 10, 15 minutes to kill. And I thought I'd go up and see the room and just sort of get engaged. As I was wandering around, I was trying to find, I went up to the top floor, and, and as I was wandering around, I was trying to find this particular business, and I couldn't find it. And I was walking up and down the hall, and I could feel my barometer going up. And I stopped the guy, and I said, oh, excuse me, can you tell me, please, where uh, such and such company is? And he went, ah, oh, yeah, such and such company. Yeah, they moved to Piermont six months ago. Oh, no. That's what I said, oh, no. And I just suddenly went, oh, crap. And in a past life, I would have freaked. I would have probably run under the glass door. I would have crashed my car on the way out of the car park, probably got a few red light tickets, um, and so on, you know, and turned up in an absolute state. But instead, you know, I could feel the thing rising, but instead, I stepped out of myself. I engaged with this idea of self-efficacy. And what I'd said was, dude, this is not your fault. You were given the wrong address, and I know this because the caterer turned up with about 10 stacks of food for lunch, and he was in the wrong place as well. It was annoying, but it wasn't the end of the world. And I'll get there, and I just need to breathe. And this is what I did next, and this is what I want to teach you, and I think this is a really, really good skill because none of us know how to breathe very well. If you just think about how you're breathing right now, you're probably all breathing around your shoulders or your collarbone. You know, very rarely do we take deep breaths down. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take you through this very quickly. So what we do, and then I'll, I'll show you through it, and then we'll actually do it. So what we do is we put our hands on our stomach, and we give ourselves a bit of a bear gut, and you breathe in for four, and then we're going to hold for, you know, five, six, seven, whatever's comfortable for you. And then we're, the most important ones are going to breathe out through our mouth and blow out, okay? So look, there's many different ways that we can actually practice this breathing. There's four square breathing, there's tiger breathing, there's lion breathing, whatever it is. Maybe do your research and find what works for you, but this is a really good way if we've got an important meeting, if we've got a client meeting or a difficult conversation, if we're traveling, if we're stressed, if we need to sleep, it's a really good thing to do. So, okay, can I get you all to sit up straight? Put your hands on your stomach. And here we go. So we're going to just breathe right down into our tummies. Hold for four. Hold for six, sorry. And then breathe out. And again, breathe in. Hold. Out. Out. 
There you go. Already I feel the room is nice and calm. And the one thing that I always notice when I do this is that my hands get warm, which just shows that we're oxygenating our blood and we're getting the circulation going. It's a really good thing to do. All right. And wrapping up, I'm just going to give you my 10 top tips for unwrapping about stress. Um, here we go. If you are stressed out, if you're really worried, if you've got a head full of crap, please just talk to someone about it. There is no shame in doing so. The only shame is you're going to miss out on life. And what I've found is that quite often all we need is a conversation. If you are stressed at a task at hand, hit the pause button and go and do something different. You know, go for a walk around the block, uh, go and talk to a mate, um, go out in the gardens, you know, go and sit under a tree, but preferably don't go online. Don't go on social media, because I believe that, you know, as good as social media it is and interesting it is, it keeps us having a very fizzy brain. I was actually speaking to a friend the other day who works for a graphic design, or owns a graphic design company, and she's actually banned um, social media and phone calls during working hours. And what she's found, because she's got a predominantly young crowd, and I'm sure there's a lot of people going, oh my God, I couldn't do that. But, you know, what she's found is productivity has just gone way up. And so has communication amongst people gone way up, and she's found it really, really beneficial. So have a bit of a detox from your phone. Um, learn mindfulness. Learn your own techniques for breathing. Uh, get into a bit of meditation. Start small and work your way up. My brother is a psychiatrist. And, uh, and he once said to me, I don't believe in anything that's not proven by research or science. And he was talking about meditation. And anyway, he went to a conference in Germany and there was a guy called Eckhart Tolle who <coughs> wrote a book called The Power of Now and he saw him speak. And it switched him on. And he is now a black belt ninja and mindfulness and meditation. I tell you this because he used to be an absolute prick. <laughs> and now he's not. He used to be an absolute arrogant jerk who was aloof and, you know, he was very condescending. And uh, now he's just calm, he's gentle, he's more engaged, he's a better listener, he has more patience. And I think he's probably a far better psychiatrist as a result. So give it a crack. You've got nothing to lose. Um, I do a lot of talks around resilience, you know, and resilience, the biggest part of resilience is that idea of acceptance. So accepting that life might be stressful, or accepting life is really difficult, and parking that for a while, and then investing all your in, in energy and knowledge into what's good. So we live in an awesome city. We live in an amazing country. We've got such wonderful opportunities. You know, you guys are doing jobs that has real meaning and purpose. So look at our family and our friends, and look what has our back. That just simply paints a better picture of life. Um, a lot of us wear a badge that says, I'm so busy. I'm so busy. You know, I, so often when I do these talks, people come up to me and say, oh, I used to really love drawing. I used to play the trumpet. Or I used to love gardening. Or I got really into cycling, and I just don't have any time for that now. You know, and the thing is, we need to make that time in our month, our week, our day, when it's just something about us. Because when we're happy doing what we love doing, we're just happier people in general. Um, there is a lot of research that shows that regular exercise is as effective for treating mild to moderate uh, anxiety and depression and stress. I don't live at gyms, I don't run marathons, I don't swim oceans, but when I do exercise, I just feel so much better in myself. It is probably one of the biggest part of my well-being management, if you like. Um, if you, uh, there's a lot of research that also shows that what we eat um, affects how we feel. So what you eat is either your greatest asset or your greatest liability. It is as simple as that. And the research shows that our gut and our brain are very much more connected than we actually realised. So think about, you know, what you eat. Um, and this one, I think, is so important. We've heard um, Nick and Darren and a few others talk about the importance of values. And my favourite quote at the moment is, be the person you would love to meet. Be the person you would love to meet. And really that, what that is, is it's taking a bit of a stock take on what's really important to you. Who's important to you? What sort of person do you want to be? Who do you want to be to your clients? Those sorts of things. And it's just a really nice way of actually focusing on how we want to be and where we want to go. And finally, I think one of the things that is the most overrated thing that we're all taking for granted is our sleep. As financial advisors, I'd say to you guys to tell your clients to invest in a good bed. You, know, you can say this to yourselves as well. Invest in a good bed, invest in block out curtains, invest in a good pillow, and make your bed a sanctity just for sleep. If we're working longer and we're sleeping less, we're taking devices to bed, it puts out blue light, which stuffs up our circadian rhythms. So just use your bed for good sleep and perhaps the occasional bonk. <laughs> All right. Now, just in wrapping up, 
I'm not going to get all kumbaya on you, and I'm not going to get all touchy-feely on you, but really everything that I've spoken to you about today, you probably all know to a fair degree already. But all the things like having a conversation, exercising, meditation, mindfulness, eating well, all those things are the most ultimate acts of self-compassion. People say, I don't have time. Make time. It's as simple as that. Because if you do, if you are kind to yourself, if you treat yourself well, if you quiet your mind, you're just going to be basically a better person to be around. You're going to be a better person to your clients. You're going to be happier, healthier, and you're going to live longer. So in closing, please be good to your good selves. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.